welcome to another book review. All right, today we are going on to book six of the Ali Beckstrom series. This one is Magic on the Hunt. And this one is actually one of my more favorite of the series. Not necessarily my favorite one. I think the ninth one is my favorite. This is a close second, mainly just because of certain fun passages that you'll hear later. Uh, this one continues the series and the uh, magical battle in Portland where you have the authority having to deal with the possession of their leader, Cedra, by the undead veiled Isabel, who just doesn't want to stay dead. Uh, to be fair, Leander was dead too, but they kind of want to live. Who wouldn't? It's just they're causing a lot of ruckus in order to do so. And tearing lots of people and organizations apart to do it. Which does not go over very well. Uh, there's a lot of character progression in this one for Shame and Tarek, for Xavian and Ali. Uh, you get to see a little bit more about Dad, uh, the uh, Daniel Beckstrom. So... It's interesting to see how they handle the various soul complements within the series, uh, more so later on in the series, but even so far now, the whole shame and Tarek, are they soul complements, are they not? You'll find out before the bitter end. But yeah, this one definitely kicks things up a notch again. Seems like every book does, but... Uh, Actually, I think the next one goes even farther to the point where all hell breaks loose. And it is not going to be pretty. But yeah, uh, as I've done in the past, if you've watched the rest of the series, we'll do the back cover, uh, page and paragraph or so of the front as an internal blurb. And then I'm going to actually do an extra couple pages just because it's one of my favorite scenes in the entire series. So you get a little extra tonight. But let's kick things off with the back cover. All right. In theory, I could call on enough magic to burn this place to the ground. But the price I'd have to pay would be as big as the spell I cast. And then I'd be nothing but ashes and burnt bones. There aren't many girls who can say they've gone into the realm of death and live to tell the tale. But to restore her lover, Xavian's soul, Alison Beckstrom, had to pay a bitter price. And things are about to get worse. It turns out the leader of the authority, the council that decides what can and can't be done with magic, is being held hostage. And when the trail leads Ali and Xavian to the secret prison where the authority locks away magical criminals who are too dangerous to be held anywhere else, they find more than they bargained for. An undead magic user has possessed one of the prisoners and he wants his freedom, and then some. Now Ali and Xavian are the first line of defense against the chaos he's about to unleash on the city of Portland. Yeah, that only begins to go into just what goes on in this book and the remaining three in the series. Uh, Alright, let's do the first page and a paragraph or so. So you kind of get an idea of where this one starts compared to where the last one left off. Xavian stretched out in my bed wearing nothing but his boxers under the covers. He lay on his side, elbow propped under his head, wide, bare shoulders blocking most of the view of my door and apartment beyond. I faced him wearing boy shorts and a tank top, and the covers tucked under my free arm. We were not touching, we were not talking, we were at war. Two out of three. Never go into battle without laying basic ground rules. Fair, he said. Zay threw rock. I threw scissors. Damn. One, Zay said. I threw paper. Zay threw rock. Mine. I looked into his eyes, brown and filled with that gold fire that came from using magic. And let me tell you, he's been using it very nicely over the past three days, since we'd sealed the undead magic users in Maeve's Inn. Three days we'd spent almost entirely in bed. We both knew our rest would be short-lived. Victor had called last night and asked me to come down so he could talk to my dead dad, who was possessing my mind, wanted to know what my dad knew about the solid-veiled, dead magic users who used the discs. 
my dad invented to reclaim bodies. Yesterday, the higher members of the Authority, Victor, Maeve, Hayden, and a few others, had broken the magical lock on the inn my dad had left there. They transported the Solid Veil to the secret prison the Authority uses to deal with magic users who break the law. Leander, who followed me into this world through Death's Gate, had not been among them. And to find out just what else Leander is up to, along with Isabel, you'll have to read more. Oh, they get up to so much. You have no idea. But this book has one of my favorite little scenes in it across the entire series, and it doesn't spoil the plot really or anything, so you're going to get a little something extra this tonight. And if you've watched uh, last week's episode of uh, Word Ninjas Live, then this will be familiar, but for those that haven't, here goes. Now, let's see here. There we go. Look at this. Shame pulled a box out of the bag. I groaned. Are you serious? Sure I am. Jenga? I said. He won't understand how to play it. He's a rock. Oh, now, you don't have to hurt his feelings, do you? Stone is a smart boy. Shame opened the box and carefully upended it onto the table. The stack of blocks teetered for a second, then stood like a nice little tower. Stone cooed and rumbled, his wings rubbing against his back. Stone and blocks, like butter and bread. See now, here's the trick. Shame pushed one of the long, thin blocks out of the tower with just his pointer finger, then placed the block to the side. Stone stood entranced, like he had just seen a magic trick for the first time. Push the block. Shame said. He chose another block, pushed it out of the stack. Stone cooed. You try. Push the block, he said. Stone scooted up closer to the table and sat on his haunches. He won't do it, Tarek said. Bet on it. What do you want to lose? Twenty bucks. Deal. Though I hate stealing from your mother. I have my own money, you arse. And yet we've never seen it. Just use one finger, Shame said, holding up his middle finger and looking at Tarek. Stone held up one finger, mimicking him. I snorted. Pick a block and push. Shame touched his fingertip to a block and nudged it a little. Did I tell you Stone showed up to help Nola and Cody, I asked? Yes, Zay said. You didn't say what exactly happened, though. He tipped up his beer, finished that one too. Not that it showed on him yet. All I got off of him were waves of discomfort and a low-level frustration that was not quite anger. I wondered if mixing beer with those emotions was a good idea and decided it didn't matter. We weren't going out again tonight. The man deserved a couple beers before bed. So did I. But I hated beer. Too bad there was no wine in the cupboard. One finger, Shame said, this time showing his index finger. Stone growled, stuck out one finger, touched a block, and looked at Shame. That's it. Push. Stone pushed. The block shifted a millimeter or two. A little bit harder. She said they were stopped by a man, I said. Cody called him the Shadow Man. Shame looked over at me. What? Stone pushed harder on the block and kept pushing so that his entire finger filled the hole where the block had been and unbalanced the whole thing. The blocks tumbled with a loud clatter over the table. Hot damn, Tarek said. Twenty bucks. Pay up. Hey now, I wasn't watching. Deal was if he could do it, not if you could see him do it. I never said he'd do it on the first try. Shame restacked the blocks into the plastic sleeve. You owe me money, Tarek said. Do I have to ask your mother to settle your bets? Again? Just hold on a damn minute, Shame grumbled. Stone gurgled and took the plastic sleeve away from him, then swiftly stacked all the blocks perfectly again into a tower. Stone held up one finger, looked at Shame, touched a block near the bottom. I don't think I'd go for that one, mate, Shame warned. Stone pushed it, careful to keep his finger out of the hole this time. He moved the block halfway through the tower, then shifted so he could reach the other side and pull the block the rest of the way out. He clacked and his wings opened and closed while he talked to the tower of blocks. He was one happy rock. That's it. Good job, Shame rubbed Stone's head. Stone soaked up the praise and pushed another block out. And another. And another. Within seconds, the tower had taken on an entirely new shape. More holes than solid lines, blocks stuck half out, completely removed, then replaced on ends on edges. It looked like an M.C. Escher painting, unbelievably eye-trickingly complex. Tara chuckled. You've been out-jenga'd by a rock. 
And that is all you get for tonight. But yeah, that is one of my favorite little scenes throughout the entire story. It doesn't really have much to do with the plot. It's just a fun little offhand scene that the characters get to have when they're not battling for their lives or the safety of Portland or the safety of magic or anything. They finally get a chance to just chill. It doesn't happen that much in this series, to be fair. So they deserve a moment. But yeah, if you've read Magic on the Hunt and you have your opinions of just how this book fits into the overall series or what do you think of Chase and Grayson's shenanigans and then there's Leander and Isabel, there's Shame and Tarek, there's Ali and Xavian and Daniel to a degree because he's just there. Uh, Cody gets to play a little bit with them and Violet gets to have a surprise in this book close to the end which is a nice little touch and it uh, once you if you're familiar with this book and how it ends then you'll know that the last three books kind of balance things out as to how the whole Beckstrom family sorts itself out after all is said and done well those who are left standing anyway uh, whatever your opinions on this book are or the overall series please post a comment on the video I'm curious what other people's opinions on this book and series are if you don't have a copy of this book or you haven't read it yet I highly recommend it and the rest of the series they're available on pretty much every single book purchasing outlet out there if you go to devinmonk.com she has a section for the Ali Beckstrom series and each individual book with links about halfway down to where you can purchase them depending on your book retailer of choice. I've gotten most of mine either from Barnes and Nobles or Books a Million I believe but they have all the options up there and this one came out I want to say in 2010 or early 2011 so it's been out long enough that you can probably find a used copy online if price is an issue. And of course, always your local library. All right, with that, we're going to sign off, tune out, and we'll see you tomorrow for book seven in the Ali Beckstrom series, which is Magic on the Line. We're getting close to the end. We're two thirds of the way through. Oh, we're getting to the really exciting parts. You have no idea. Unless you've read the whole series, in which case you do have an idea. Alright guys, until next time.